Welcome to AMP1 or Anatomy and Physiology 1. So we'll start with some introductory material. We'll start with what is anatomy and physiology over here. Then we'll talk about the levels of structural organization. As a preview, that's like what are the different things that can make up the body? So atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, things like that, if you've heard those terms. We'll then go through the organ system. So what's your lymphatic system? What's your endocrine system? We'll then go through necessary life functions. These are things that biological organisms need to be able to do, so need to maintain boundaries and things like that. We'll go through survival needs. What do you need to get from your environment? So you need some heat from somewhere. That's an example of a survival need. Feedback control, so this is things like positive feedback when things build and build and build. And homeostasis is negative feedback when we try to get things back under control, like you try to maintain a certain body temperature. We'll finish up with directional terminology. So how do we refer to up, down, left, right, in, out, things like that in the body. Before we get to too much content, I'd like to introduce you briefly to the structure. So what are all these colors? that I'm using to organize the information. I think organizing information is the key to getting things into your brain. And the faster you can get things into your brain on a simple level, the sooner you can build up that knowledge into a more richer understanding and application of the information. One of the ways you describe building up knowledge is Bloom's taxonomy, and that's shown over here. And this is gonna be the basis for all of our presentations. I'll get to this in a moment, but you notice there's some color coding here. And that's coded with coloring over here because I want to organize the information, get it into your brain as frustration free as possible. So then we can start building up that knowledge into a more critical thinking level of thoughts. So applying the knowledge. There are different levels of knowing things. So to remember is to basically memorize a fact. To understand is to begin to see how those facts fit in with other facts. To apply means to know how to use those facts. So put them into use. And there's all kinds of different adverbs for the different types of thinking in Bloop's taxonomy, and you can look those up, so Google that. I think it's really important that students understand the different levels of learning, that learning is not just memorizing facts. So look those up, but in my view, analyze means to see how facts fit together into a bigger picture. You're gonna hear me talk about big picture and concepts all the time. You have to see the forest from the trees. Because often in medicine, one little fact is changing, and you have to see how that's gonna change the big picture. When you evaluate, you see how your analysis changes when those facts change. And lastly, to create is to predict how you can deal with facts changing. To put those all together, for example, you would gather facts like a patient survey or triage. You try to understand them. Then you'd see how they apply to a patient's health. So how do their symptoms apply to their health? Analyze what sort of problems a person is having, evaluate the possible solutions, and then create a treatment plan. So going into allied health, you're going to have to be able to think along all different levels of Bloom's taxonomy, even though we often associate learning with just the basic levels. a is going to push you to all these different levels, and allied health is going to push you even further. As you can see on the right then, part of my effort to organize our class content is to color code the level of knowledge we're using. So in the middle is that knowledge. We get out to some understanding and we might not always hit all the different levels, but I'm trying to show the different levels that we're starting with foundational knowledge and we're gonna build out to deeper levels of blooms. So we'll always start with the basic facts to remember, but then as we move out, we'll build on that knowledge to reach higher levels of knowledge or higher levels of blooms taxonomy. Another thing I'd like to point out is the purple, which I describe as mastery skills. Part of college is learning how to learn. And once you learn how to learn, then the facts don't matter as much because you essentially learn how to learn. So I don't know the exact quote from Einstein, but somebody asked Einstein, why don't you know how many feet are in a mile? And he basically said, why memorize a fact? Why fill my mind with facts? My mind needs to be thinking. So when you get good at the basic skills in AMP, like how to look up a disease, what are the different symptoms that work? What are the different structures that are necessary for this body function to work as well as it should? Then you can apply that to all kinds of other things in AMP. So those are what I would call mastery skills. So once you get good at these mastery skills, you'll be able to apply those skills to all areas of AMP to be a creative and deep thinker. So we'll go over these more and more as we move along, but essentially you need to have good critical thinking skills, which I define here as asking questions. You also have to have digital literacy to figure out like where's the place to go to answer that question. Is Wikipedia a good place? Is WebMD? Are, are certain advertising and infomercials, are those good sources? You wanna avoid logical fallacies. So sometimes our brain picks out things that are true or we think they're true and they're not. 
because our brain sometimes takes shortcuts in our thinking and that makes us come to the wrong conclusion. We trick ourselves. Social collaboration, more brains are better than one brain. Conceptualize, see the big picture. And ultimately what you want to be able to do after you do all those steps is ask a better question. So critical thinking is all about asking questions in order to ask better questions. Another thing you need to be able to do is simplify complexity. A classic statement is that you don't understand something until you can explain it to your mom. If you're going into allied health, you'll have to communicate information to your patient a lot. Thus, you need to be able to describe things in a simple way. So you need to be able to take complex things and make it simple. And we'll talk about things like hierarchical relationships. So how do different levels of structure, like how does a cell affect a tissue, affect an organ in an organ system? organ system interrelationships like how does the lungs affect the heart and then the heart affects other structures and then homeostasis and feedback are here last we'll get to this soon but this is going to be a constant thread through the entire course is anatomy is how things look we'll come back to this physiology is how things work so you always want to be able to make that connection how can i figure out how something's working based on how it looks but then we want to extend that physiology also into clinical testing so what do we learn from your analysis What's an EKG? What's an EEG? Things like that. Clinical testing. Into clinical care. How does the physiology tell us how to take care of patients? And of course, we're not going to go into great depth here, but we're going to create a basic foundation of how does anatomy relate to physiology, relate to clinical care. We're going to dabble in pharmacology as well, and we'll come back to pathology quite often because anytime something goes wrong with anatomy and physiology, you're going to get disease, which is pathology. So to me, things fit together in this way down here. So as you learn how to think on the different levels of Bloom's taxonomy, it helps you gain the skills to do mastery levels of thinking. So as you move up Bloom's, you move into this area where you start to get the mastery skills. Then those mastery skills help you more quickly take in new information up through Bloom's taxonomy level of thinking. So that's why I kind of have these two hourglasses. What I'm trying to say here is essentially building up through Bloom's will give you the skills to have mastery skills. And then mastery skills will come back around and help you build back up through blooms really quick. So what I'm trying to represent here with the sands through the hourglass kind of metaphor here is keep rotating through blooms and mastery thinking because they're going to build on each other. So it seems appropriate to start with Descartes' Vitruvian Man, which was fully titled The Proportions of the Human Body According to Vitruvius. So we'll start over here with anatomy and physiology. First, let's define anatomy. As it says here, anatomy is the study of the structure of the body parts and their relationships to one another. In shorthand, this is how things look. Physiology is the study of the function of the body's structural machinery. So function, this is how the body works. One of the things that's challenging about anatomy and physiology and allied health is that you have to think in ways you haven't really been asked to think before. So a and is going to be a different class than probably any other class you've had, and it's going to begin a thinking process. This is probably different than you've been asked to think before. So you need to think with your eyes. You need to be able to see if somebody's lips are blue, because that means cyanosis. You need to be able to think with smell, so you can smell certain smells on the breath, which will tell somebody, which will tell you that somebody's in ketosis, or you can smell necrosis, or you can even smell a breakdown of ammonia and sweat sometimes if there's a problem with protein digestion. What are the ways can you think that you have to use your senses to be successful in healthcare? So you have to be able to think with your fingertips as well to palpate and hearing as well and auscultation. Let's come back to anatomy. So let's get a bit more specific about anatomy. There are multiple types of anatomy, but we can begin to break them down by breaking things down into gross which is the anatomy of things that can be seen with the naked eye. Microscopic anatomy, where you're looking at things through a microscope, and developmental, where you're looking at changes over time. We can divide things up even more. For example, we can divide up gross anatomy into regional, where all structures in one part of the body, such as the abdomen or the leg, are studied. So a podiatrist would be a regional anatomist who studies the feet. Systemic would be gross anatomy of the body studied by systems. So if you're a gastroenterologist, you're studying the digestive system. Surface would be to study the internal structures as they relate to the overlying skin. We can divide up microscopic anatomy into cytology, which is the study of the cell, and histology, which is the study of tissues. Tissues are groups of cells working together to perform a unified function. So cytology would be the study of the neuron, 
Histology would be the study of how different neurons and other cell types work together to help you to think. In developmental anatomy, there's a delineation at birth. So study of anatomy before birth is called embryology. When we trace the structural changes all throughout life, this is called, again, developmental anatomy. There are other types of anatomy. So some examples are pathological anatomy, which is the study of structural changes caused by disease. Radiographic anatomy for the rad text, which is the study of internal structures visualized by really any kind of visualization device, not necessarily x-rays. It could be MRI or PET scans or things like that, CAT scans. Molecular biology, which is the study of anatomical structures at a subcellular level. One of the skills you need to be successful in A&P and in healthcare is to be able to organize information because there's so much information to wrap your brain around. You have to be able to organize it. Organization allows you to memorize information that's connected together. And here's a good way to study the different types of anatomy. One of the things I'll rail on this class is it's not really a three by five note card kind of class. It's more of a four by six or a full piece of paper kind of class. So you want to put the facts together before you start memorizing it. And this is a good way to put the different types of anatomy on one big four by six note card so you can study all the different branches of anatomy. While we're still talking about anatomy, this is a good time to point out that there's a lot of variability in anatomy. There's some individuals whose heart is crisscrossed, had a student recently who had the right ventricle was actually on the left, or someone's pancreas can actually be on the left. Just kidding, the pancreas is on the left. But there are situations where the liver can be on the left and the pancreas is on the right. Those are kind of big examples of anatomical variability. But even when you're looking at the cadaver, you're going to see small differences in anatomy and physiology too. Just the structure, when you look at our two cadavers, of how arteries and veins run can be different. Some don't even have a whole muscle called the palmaris longus. It's easier to show you directly, but if you flex your wrist, if you pull up your wrist, if you see a tendon in the middle of the front of your forearm, then you have the palmaris longus. But about 10% of people don't have that muscle, and no tendon will pop up when they flex their wrist. While 90% of anatomy is pretty consistent, a 10% difference is still pretty huge when you're talking about the significant effects on health and treating people. There's also physiological differences, so drugs might affect certain populations differently as well. We're going to go into a bit of physiology now. So we just finished anatomy. Let's go into physiology. So physiology, just as there are different types of anatomy, there are different types of physiology. These usually align with organ systems. So we'll understand that a little bit more when we get through the organ systems. So for example, there might be a renal physiologist that studies the kidney or a neurophysiologist who studies the nervous system or a cardiovascular physiologist which studies heart and blood vessels. As it says here, understanding physiology also requires a knowledge of physics and chemistry, which explains things like electrical currents, blood pressure, and the way muscle uses bones for levers for movement. So we'll talk about chemistry in the next section, but this is just a heads up that even though it's anatomy and physiology, we do have to dabble in chemistry and physics as well. To be more specific, there are essential tools for the study of physiology. So the ability to focus at many different levels from systemic to cellular and molecular. So seeing how a problem can go wrong with a cell leading to a whole system failure. Basic physical principles like Ohm's law and electrical currents, Boyle's law and pressure, levers and movement, and then some basic chemical pr principles as well. Like diffusion and osmosis. Linking anatomy to physiology is something called the principle of complementarity, in that anatomy and physiology help each other out. They complement one another. There are a lot of different ways to state the principle of complementarity. Function always reflects structure. What a structure can do depends on its specific form. You can tell what something does by looking at it, or you can try to figure out what something does by looking at it. You only have a hammer if the hammer head is attached to the handle, so you must know the anatomy of the hammer in order to know what its function is. Let's jump out quick and remind you that relating anatomy to physiology is one of the mastery skills in this class. So remember way over here, the principle of complementarity is form and function. So anatomy is we're going to relate to physiology and we're going to extend that relationship from physiology to clinical testing, clinical care, pharmacology, and pathology. I call these mastery skills as I said, sometimes I call them big ideas. So I'm going to refer to these big ideas over and over in the class. And a lot of the big ideas begin with how does anatomy relate to physiology. 
As an example, can you use what you see from the anatomy here to predict which side of the heart pumps blood at a higher pressure? So your heart pumps into two circuits. One goes out to the whole body and one goes out to the lung. The left pumps blood at a high pressure to push blood through the entire systemic circulation. So out to your big toes, whereas the right side pumps blood only to the lungs and back. Furthermore, the pressure in the lungs has to be low to avoid damaging the lung tissue. So we can see then that there's a lot of muscle here. So the left side pumps blood out to the entire body. The smaller amount of tissue on the right pumps blood out to the lungs and back. So you can see the difference in the amount of muscle. And that tells you that the left side develops a higher pressure than the right side of the heart. You can see that in the lower left figure that shows lung structure. So the lung structure is very delicate. We have capillaries in here and there's air in here and you don't want any more barrier than you have to have between the air that's in this air sac and the capillary. So the capillaries have to be very thin, which means there's a low blood pressure in here. Otherwise, those blood vessels would pop. This is a little bit broader view. On the top left are what are called liver heptads. Blood enters the outside and filters through the inside. And you can see that if there's a disruption in the structure, that things are not going to work as well as they should in the liver. The upper right is a neuron. Neurons help us to see connections between things and learning. So they need to have many arms. So they help us make connections like when I hear rain on the roof and I know I'm going to have to look nice today, I know I'm going to have to carry a computer today, then I better take an umbrella. So you connect different things based on outcomes you've experienced in the past. To have all those connections, you have to have a structure that will reach out and connect a lot of different things. Down here, our skin is made up of layers on layers of layers of dead cells. So that if we remove some of those dead cells, there's still cells left over to provide a barrier. So you can start to see in these examples, if you look at how things look, you can start to figure out how things work. And that's the principle of complementarity, or in its simplest form, we call it form reflex function. Another example, if heart muscle is just right, there's enough strength to pump blood and all the heart tissue receives blood. In the lower right, the heart muscle has gotten too thick. So if you've had high blood pressure or if grandma has high blood pressure, just as any muscle that's worked will get thicker, if, if the heart has to pump against high blood pressure, it gets thicker. The problem with that is the blood vessels are on the outside and the blood can't reach the inner structure as well, so it begins to start to die. As the inner tissue starts to die, the heart gets bigger and bigger but it gets thinner and thinner. And we can see just by looking at this, that this is an example of a heart that's not going to be able to pump blood very well. This is congestive heart failure. So we can kind of, by looking at the different structures, see what's going to happen physiologically and how that's gonna to relate to pathology or disease. So again, form reflects function and that predicts disease. I like to put questions in the presentation so you can check your answers. In a teaching world, this is called formative assessment, where we're basically forming the basis for learning. And the way it works is if you cannot answer this question, it tells you that you probably should move on, but you should go back, skip back five minutes, and be able to go back over the information to figure out what the answer was. Don't move forward unless you know the answer. So it's kind of one of those things where you have to take responsibility for your own learning and realize if I didn't get the answer to this one correct, I should not be moving forward, I should go back. What is the study of the body structure? Obviously, this one's a pretty easy one at this point. The answer is anatomy. What is the study of the body's function? Function is physiology. The study of the function of the human body is termed, kind of a, it's another way to put the same question, but I would say function is physiology. When the anatomy of a body part is intimately tied to its specific function, scientists call this the principle of complementarity, nature of structure and function. So that's the principle of complementarity. And again, it's one of those tricky things that happens all the time in anatomy and physiology where you have two different names. So it's called form and function. It's called the principle of complementarity. There's even structures in the body that have two names, like the mitral valve and the bicuspid valve are two very different names for the same exact structure. So we've covered anatomy, we've covered physiology, and we've covered the principle of complementarity. This is one of the reasons I like Prezi is because you can cluster information together. Now where we're going is levels of structural organization. 
So next up is to look at hierarchies of anatomical structure. So this is one of our essential tools of physiology. We need to be able to focus at many different levels from systemic to cellular to molecular. So for example, we need to see the problems with oxygen, which is a molecule, will lead to problems with parts of the cells that make energy. Those are called mitochondria. And if those parts cells cannot make energy, cells are gonna die. And if enough cells die, then that's gonna to lead to organ failure. And when organ fails, whole organ systems fail. And when organ system fails, organisms die. So this again is one of our big ideas in the class. So it's hierarchical relationships. It's a way that we can take things that look really complex and realize that it's pretty simple. If you can't get oxygen into your lung and that causes the whole organism to die, it's a pretty simple connection that oxygen doesn't allow the mitochondria to make energy and without energy cells die. And when cells die, organs die. And when organs die, organ systems die. And when organ systems die, organisms die. With level of structural organization, what we're talking about is that we need to study anatomy and physiology at different levels. So at the atomic level, so talking about atoms, this could be iron, it could be oxygen. We then need to be able to talk about the molecular level. So in the body, oxygen atoms combine to, to make O2, which is an oxygen molecule. That oxygen is mainly used in an organelle called a mitochondria. And then that mitochondria makes energy so that things like muscles or muscle cells can do what they need to do, in this case, contract. So when we get to cells, we'll talk about the different organelles of the body. And there's different types of cells. Groups of cells working together for the same function are tissues. Groups of tissues working together to do the same thing are organs. Groups of organs working together to do the same things are organ systems, and organ systems work together to promote the health of the organism. So all the organ systems combine into the organism. So just briefly here, we have atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and organisms. To understand physiological processes then, we might need to look at different anatomical levels. So the atom oxygen combines together into O2, which is molecular oxygen, which binds to an iron and a heme molecule, which is another molecule, and it binds to an entire protein called hemoglobin. So that again would be a molecule. Hemoglobin carries oxygen out to cells, and in those cells it's used by mitochondria to make energy. That energy might be used to power a blood vessel, it might constrict, it might dilate to allow blood flow, and then that blood needs to flow to an organ so that the organ system can work. So again, if you have a problem with oxygen, either taking it into the lungs, or maybe you have a problem with this molecule like sickle cell, if you have sickle cell and can't load oxygen, it's going to affect all the different levels of structural organization. So we need to be able to think at all different levels of structural organization. Which of the following is a logical organization? So which one's the right order? I don't like atoms going to cells because I know molecules come before cells. I know atoms come before molecules, so B is incorrect. So cross out B, cross out A. Atoms, tissues, molecules, I don't like that one because atoms don't go to tissues. Hopefully D is correct. Atoms, molecules, cells, and tissues. That's correct. A group of similar cells that perform the same function is classified as a tissue. It's not my best and most well-designed worksheet, but the point I'm trying to get across is that we should think about problems in healthcare as possibly arising from each anatomical level. So for example, Mucus affects tissues in cystic fibrosis as it fills up the lungs. So cystic fibrosis is a problem moving water to wash out mucus. Now since there's mucus, there's a decreased ability to take in oxygen molecules. So that's a problem with the atomic level. Then without enough oxygen, mitochondria cannot function. So now this is a problem at the organelle level. If the mitochondria can't make the molecule ATP, which is your body's energy molecule, then cells can't contract. And if muscle cells can't contract to cause the lungs to essentially work, so the diaphragm, then the whole respiratory system doesn't work. And if the respiratory system doesn't work, then the whole organism is not going to get enough oxygen. 
So we started with a problem at the tissue level caused by molecules. So mucus is covering the lung tissue, so I can't take in oxygen, so that's an atomic problem. Becomes an organelle problem because the mitochondria can't get the oxygen to make energy. ATP is an energy molecule. If cells don't have energy, then they're not going to function correctly, and maybe muscle cells aren't going to contract. So organs like the diaphragm won't work, which means the respiratory system won't work, which means the whole organism is not going to work. And one of the things we're going to come to later, and I'm just going to plant the seed here, is if the organism doesn't have enough oxygen, can't get enough into the lungs, then it's going to cause a feedback. So essentially, if the diaphragm can't work to suck air into the lungs, it's going to magnify the original problem, which is there's mucus. So essentially, it's not only going to be harder for the oxygen that's in the lungs to get past the mucus, but it's going to be harder to get oxygen into the lungs in the first place. That's a positive feedback cycle where things are going to get worse and worse. I like to test in a variety of ways. You're always going to have multiple choice tests because you have to get good at multiple choice test taking skills because ultimately your ability to practice in your field is probably going to come down to a multiple choice test in the form of a boards exam. So you have to get better at multiple choice. I believe I'm corrected on the first test in AMP1. There's 50 multiple choice. There's also three essays. The first essay is essentially I want you to go out and find diseases associated with each level of structural organization. I have some examples here and I don't think you should use my examples because maybe they're a little bit too deep. But go out and find diseases associated with atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and organisms. doesn't have to be the same disease, but you have to go out and find a disease that begins with a problem with an atom, a disease that begins with a problem with a molecule, a disease that begins with a problem of organelles. So for example, I like cystic fibrosis because my wife is a carrier for cystic fibrosis and I studied cystic fibrosis. There's a 50-50 shot that my kids are carriers for cystic fibrosis. So in CF, the problem is a chloride ion. You can't move chloride. Your body uses chloride to move water. It does this in things like diarrhea. It also does this to wash out mucus in the lungs. So if you can't move chloride, you can't move water. So in cystic fibrosis, chloride is not pumped into and out of cells as it should be. And if chloride can't be pumped into and out of cells, there's a problem moving water. Here, the molecule that's going wrong is the water. Cystic fibrosis is due to a problem with something called the Golgi apparatus in the cell. The Golgi apparatus basically determines if a protein is made correctly or not. And it fails in this case because the CF protein would work, but the Golgi destroys it. So it's a problem with the Golgi. Cells. Sickle cell anemia occurs when red blood cells turn from round red blood cells into long, stretched out sickle shapes, and then they block capillaries. So that's a problem with a cellular structure. Tissues in cystic fibrosis, the inability to move water into and out of cells results in a buildup of mucus. Then this mucus blocks small tubes in the pancreas and reproductive system. It also fills up the air sacs in the lungs. In cystic fibrosis, when the lungs fill with mucus, it's difficult to get air from the lung into the blood. In cystic fibrosis, when the lungs fill with mucus and it's difficult to get air from the lung into the blood, the respiratory system fails to deliver enough oxygen to the body. And then in NCF again, when the lungs fill with mucus and it's difficult to get air from the lung into the blood, the respiratory system fails to deliver enough oxygen to the body. This will lead to organ system failure and eventually death from lack of delivery of oxygen. Now the way it's going to look on the test is like this. So this is how I'm wording it probably be worded very similar so if you don't understand the wording here ask me about this before the test so for each of the eight levels of hierarchy give a three to four sentence description in your own words not memorized from Wikipedia or somewhere of how a disease affects that level it doesn't have to be the same disease but you have to have a different disease that affects each of the different organ system levels next up is organ systems. So next we'll go through the various organ systems. Obviously we'll go through each organ system as we move through AMP. So technically I'd like to point out that the beginning of AMP1 is a little bit tricky because we do intro and then we do chemistry. And chemistry it's hard to always understand how the chemistry relates to AMP, but it's going to pop up over and over so we have to begin with chemistry. Then we're going to move into cells and tissues. 
And so it's a little bit hard to get through the first part of AMP until we get to the organ systems. Once we get to the organ systems, it's much easier to relate that disease of an organ system and why we're taking the class. So you kind of got to tough it out for these first four modules in AMP. And then we'll get to the organ systems. And then it's easier because then you realize, well, skin cancer kills people or glioblastoma kills people. And so I need to understand what a glial cell is gets easier once we get to the organ systems. At this point, know the basic functions of each organ system and be able to identify what organ system an organ is in. So if I ask you what organ system is the pancreas in, you know what system the pancreas is in. You should probably also be able to recall the organ systems. So if I give you a quiz to just say what are the organ systems of the body, you should be able to write down the organ systems. So I'm going to read these off in case you're just listening to the podcast. One of the reasons I do podcasts is so that you can learn while your hands are busy, but your brain is free. Obviously, if you're watching this on a computer screen, it's going to look like I'm just reading off the slides, which is what I'm doing. But I'm doing it just in case, just in case you're just listening and not looking. But the skeletal system is composed of bone, cartilage, and ligaments. It protects the body. As in, think about how the skull protects the body or protects the brain. The skeleton supports the body, as in, think of the spinal cord, it holds you up. Bones provide something for muscles to pull against. Also, blood cells are formed in bone. Lastly, as we go through AMP1, you'll see that calcium is a pretty important signaling molecule in the body. It's a good to have a bank account of sorts to make sure there's always plenty of calcium. So bone acts as that bank account, storing calcium for when it might be needed. I often talk about calcium as the on switch. So it's how one neuron talks to another. It's how muscle contracts when sperm meets egg. Calcium waves are listed across the egg to start dividing up the egg into a head and a tail, so to speak, or a top and a bottom. So calcium is a pretty important ion in the body. So you kind of need a bank account of it. You need to be able to have a storage of it. The female reproductive system is composed of the mammary glands, so the breast, ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina. The main function is the production of offspring. Ovaries produce eggs and female sex hormones. The female reproductive system also contains the site for fertilization and development of the fetus, as well as the mammary glands to produce milk to nourish the newborn. The urinary system is composed of the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. The kidneys regulate water, electrolyte, pH balance of the blood, and eliminates nitrogenous waste from the body. You're going to hear me say this many times in AMP2, and I'll probably sneak it in plenty of times in AMP1. The urinary system and electrolytes is the most difficult system in AMP2. I'll say that 50 times in AMP2 between the first lecture and before we get to this test. Respiratory system is composed of the nasal cavity, pharynx, trachea, bronchi, and lungs. The respiratory system keeps blood supplied with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. It also balances acid levels. Cardiovascular system is composed of the heart and blood vessels. The heart pumps blood. The blood vessels transport blood throughout the body. Blood delivers oxygen and nutrients while picking up waste products and delivering them back to both the lungs in the case of CO2 and the kidneys in the case of all other waste products. Muscular system is... The muscular system is composed of muscles and tendons and allows manipulation of the environment, locomotion, and facial expression. So muscles also maintain posture and produce heat when they shiver. The integumentary system, or skin, forms the external body covering and is composed of the skin, sweat glands, oil glands, hair, and nails. Skin protects deep tissue from injury and it also helps make vitamin D, which is going to be important in absorbing calcium. Endocrine system is composed of the pituitary gland, thyroid gland, pancreas, adrenal glands, gonads, and other tissues, lots of other tissues still. Endocrine system functions in long-term changes such as metabolism and reproduction. The male reproductive system is composed of prostate gland, penis, testes, scrotum, and the ductus deferens. As with the female system, the main function of the male reproductive system is the production of offspring. Testes produce sperm, male sex hormones, while ducts and glands deliver sperm to the female reproductive tract. The digestive system breaks down food into absorbable units that enter the blood and eliminates indigestible foodstuffs as feces. The lymphatic system is composed of red bone marrow, thymus, spleen, lymph nodes, and lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic system picks up fluid leaked from the blood vessels and returns it back into the regular blood circulation. It disposes of debris and it houses white blood cells involved with immunity. So the lymphatic system picks up leaked fluid and it's also the primary kind of home base of the immune system. The nervous system is composed of the brain, spinal column, and nerves. 
and it's the fast acting control system of the body. So the nervous system responds to stimuli by activating muscles and glands. Another big idea or mastery skill is to see how organ systems interact, how they have an interrelationship. Often the failure of one system will lead to failures in other systems. For some examples, think about how multiple systems are necessary for generating heat or regulating blood pressure, excretion, breathing, and eating. Again, this is one of our main big ideas or mastery skills. So organ system interrelationships over here. As an example of how organ systems have to work together is to follow how the body uses multiple systems to get calcium because several systems require calcium. The integumentary system makes vitamin D in an inactive form, so it doesn't work yet. But when that vitamin D goes through the kidneys, the kidney activates vitamin D, which then signals the digestive system to take up more calcium. It also tells the endocrine system to get calcium out of bone, and it tells the kidneys to not lose any calcium in the urine. This calcium is then used to make bone, to cause muscle contraction in the heart and skeletal muscles, so in the heart and skeletal muscles. Calcium even helps set up the timing of the heart related to the cardiovascular system. The nervous system needs calcium to signal, so for one neuron to talk to another neuron requires calcium. And all of these together requ are required for the respiratory system to work, for the diaphragm to contract and to breathe in oxygen. So all of this is related to calcium. As I said before, I'm going to let you know the essays in advance, and you can actually check your essays with me in advance because I want to make sure that we're on the same page as far as expectations go. So another essay on exam one is describe a possible pathological connection between the organ systems. A connection can be two, three, or more organ systems. All organ systems should be used at least once. So here's how it's going to be used. You're going to come up with an organ system and how it affects another organ system. Here are some examples. So for example, failure of the lymphatic system to pick up leak fluid would mean fluid builds up in the skin causing edema. So skin then can't make vitamin D and has sores that allow pathogens to enter. So another line off to the right of this could be, well, if the skin is allowing pathogens to enter, then the immune system is failing. The endocrine system fails to control calcium levels. Decreased calcium leads to weakened bones. So this is the skeletal system. Weakened bones provide less structure for muscles to pull against. So this is a muscle system problem. Weakened muscles means it's harder for the respiratory systems to cause one to breathe in and breathe out. Without as much oxygen, neurons fail due to lack of oxygen. So this is the endocrine system, skeletal system, muscle system, respiratory system, neuronal system. Urinary fails to get rid of extra fluid. Extra fluid builds up, causes damage to the heart and blood pressure. So that's the urinary system affecting the cardiovascular system. Failure of the immune system leads to persistence of bacteria. Bacteria scar female reproductive system leading to infertility. So that's the immune system affecting the reproductive system. Problems with the digestive system might result in not enough nutrient absorption. Lack of nutrients le leads to failure of the male reproductive system. So again, they have to be at least two connections up to four connections. If we go back quick, this is essentially how the question would look on the test. So I need five two-step connections that are required. You can get an extra credit point if you add a third and a fourth connection to each of these. And again, this is essentially what you're going to have to do in almost all allied health because what lands somebody in the hospital is not what's happening to them right now. You have to track back to what happened before to this patient that got him into this situation. So consistent high blood pressure, going back to an example we talked about earlier, that's a problem with blood vessels, or maybe it's a problem with the kidneys, leads to damage to the heart, leads to thinning of the heart, leads to less blood flow. So now you've got a problem with the kidneys, causing a problem with the heart, causing a problem with the cardiovascular system.
Next up for us, it gets a little simple here, are necessary life functions and survival needs. I like to simplify things, so put them into your own words. So while the technical definition of necessary life functions are things living organisms must do in their environment, I like to just key on that word do. So necessary life functions are things organisms need to do. The technical definition of a survival needs our survival needs are things organisms must get from their environment. And again, key on that word, get. As stated in the slide, necessary life functions are you have to maintain boundaries. The internal environment has to remain distinct from the external. You just can't let anything inside of the body. We can break this down to the cellular level. So cells have to keep things in and out with plasma membranes. And at the organismal level, so you have skin to keep things in and out. Movement, which is locomotion or propulsion, so moving things through the body. Contractility, so contracting muscles would be an example of movement. Responsiveness, the ability to sense changes in the environment and respond to them. So if you're getting cold, you need to be able to put on a sweatshirt, things like that. Or shiver, digestion, breakdowns of ingested foodstuffs. Continuing on, metabolism, all the chemical reactions that occur in the body. There's about 400,000 chemical reactions per second per cell in the body. That's a lot of metabolism. Excretion would be to remove wastes. Reproduction can also be divided into cellular and organismal levels. So definitely cellular reproduction is important for an individual to survive. So a, a cell has to divide to make two identical daughter cells. Organismal is not important for the individual per se, but it is important for the survival of a biological species. So that would be sperm and egg unite to make a whole new person. And then growth would be increase in size of a body part or the organism. Of the eight necessary life functions, which of the following is not required for an individual survival? So reproduction is not important for an organism, but it is important for species. You do need to maintain boundaries. You do need to metabolize and you do need to be able to excrete. Survival needs include getting nutrients, so chemical substances used for energy and cell building. Oxygen, you need to get oxygen for metabolic reactions to make energy. Water provides the necessary environment for chemical reactions, and we'll talk about some special qualities of water when we get to chemistry. Maintaining normal body temperature, so necessary for chemical reactions to occur at life-sustaining rates. Again, at 400,000 chemical reactions per cell per second, there's a certain rate that that needs to happen at, and it can't speed up or it can't slow down that much. So you have to maintain normal body temperature to prevent those chemical reactions from going too fast or too slow. You also need atmospheric pressure, so you need some help getting oxygen into the lungs. Those are survival needs. Next is feedback control. Here again is one of our big ideas, our mastery level ideas in a &P. There are two types of feedback control. There's positive and negative. We mentioned positive feedback previously when we talked about how if there's a decrease in oxygen or atoms at the atomic level, the mitochondria can't make as much energy, so organelles with less energy in the form of the molecule ATP, muscle cells can't contract as well. If muscles can't contract as well, it's hard for the diaphragm to take in oxygen. This means there's less oxygen in the body. Redundancy is good in AMP. So we went through that one before, going through it again. Do you see how that when there's damaged tissue, it's going to magnify the original problem and it's going to get worse and worse. So that's an example of positive feedback. The other type of feedback is generally good. This is negative feedback. It's kind of odd that positive feedback is kind of a bad thing because it's going to get worse and worse. Negative feedback is you're trying to get things back under control and that's usually a good thing. So again, feedback is one of our mastery level ideas or our big ideas and it goes into simplifying complexity. We're going to start with negative feedback. Another name for negative feedback is homeostasis. So homeostasis is the ability to maintain a relatively stable internal environment in an ever-changing outside world. So it's relatively stable. It's not always perfect. Your temperature might vary up and down two-tenths of a degree. Often, breakdowns in health involve breakdowns in homeostasis. In a homeostatic mechanism, the variable is what is being controlled. So body temperature would be a good example. Acidity, blood glucose levels, ion concentration. So how much sodium do you have in your body? How much calcium do you have in your body? From there, there are three parts. The receptor senses the variable. 
the control center decides what to do based on the input of the receptor, and then the effector works to change the variable. So an example is that a temperature receptor can sense temperature and tell the control center in the brain, hey, I'm getting too warm. If you're hot, a sweat gland may be the effector, or if you're too cold, muscles might shiver, or blood vessels might constrict to move blood down into your core away from your skin. The muscle there, or the blood vessel there, is the effector. So the effector will then change the variable, and the receptor will see the change in the variable and tell the control center if things need to keep changing. So for example, body temperature exceeds 37 degrees C. That's too warm. Nerve cells in the skin sense that. Tell the brain, which is the control center, to have the sweat cells start to sweat, which is going to start you cooling off. And hopefully it's going to keep cooling you off until body temperature no longer exceeds 37 degrees C. One reason to think about all three parts is that any one of those parts can fail and cause a loss of homeostasis. So maybe the receptor can't sense a problem anymore, or the control center gets the input, but it can't initiate a correction. Or maybe the effector is unable to bring the variable back into range. I was driving my car today, and a tire pressure light comes on. So I stop, and I fill up the tires, and they all look great, and the tire pressure sensor doesn't go off. So in that case, the sensor is the problem. And that can happen in the body too, and it's kind of actually nice when it's the sensor is the problem because even though that's kind of a pain, that's not a huge issue. In my car, having the sensor go bad is not as bad as actually having a tire go flat. But any one of those problems can cause a breakdown in homeostasis. The reason homeostasis is referred to as negative feedback is that the mechanisms involve sensing that something is moving out of its normal range. You're getting too hot. Once sensed, the body deals with this by trying to negate that change in the variable. It's trying to turn the movement out of the range back around to normal. It's trying to bring it back around negative. So this is called negative feedback. And again, it's one of those tricky things because negative feedback is good. You're trying to get things back into its normal range. Here's a bit of a more complex one. So the middle shows the variable calcium levels. If the variable, again calcium, gets too high, the thyroid will sense that and release calcitonin. Calcitonin will tell bone to hold on to its calcium, and the kidneys will get rid of calcium. So we're not going to break down any more bone, and the kidneys are not going to absorb any more calcium. And by break down bone, I mean release calcium from the bone. So calcium levels will decrease. So the receptor in the control center is the thyroid, and the effector is calcitonin. If, on the other hand, calcium levels get too low, parathyroid is released. Parathyroid tells a cell called an osteoclast to get some calcium out of the bone. We tell the kidneys to absorb more calcium, and we tell the gut to absorb more calcium. And those three things are going to cause calcium levels to rise again and bring us back into this normal range. So a homeostatic feedback loop has a mechanism to deal with if the condition or the variable gets too high and if the variable gets too low. The last essay on the first exam is to give a homeostatic mechanism. should be fairly simple. Be sure that you have a receptor, control center, and effector for both increases and decreases in the variable. You may do something simple like body temperature, or if you like to challenge yourself more, look into something like blood glucose or calcium. Or if you really like to push yourself, look into sodium, fluid, or acid homeostasis. When we get into AMP2, we'll cover six of the more complex homeostatic mechanisms, sodium, potassium, calcium, fluid, isotonic fluid, and pH. And when we do these, you're going to see the variables in the middle. We're going to see what happens if sodium gets too high, what happens if sodium gets too low? We're going to list the causes of sodium getting too high. We're going to list the causes of sodium getting too low. We're going to list the effects of sodium getting too high and the effects of sodium getting too low. And in the middle are the different variables that help us to make sure that sodium comes back down if it gets too high. So if you consume too much sodium, the hypothalamus will make you thirsty. Something called AMP will inhibit something called renin, and you'll lose sodium from the urine. Macula densa cells will decrease blood pressure. And ADH from the posterior pituitary will help you to increase your water absorption to balance out the sodium. So these homeostatic mechanisms are going to pop up over and over. 
That's probably going to be one of the most difficult things in your last exam in AMP2 is to memorize these homeostatic diagrams for sodium, potassium, calcium, blood pressure, pure water, and acid. And there might be the reason to like to look at these a little bit now because you're going to see as we go through AMP1, we're going to talk about muscle contraction. We're going to talk about action potentials in the brain. We're going to talk about neurotransmitters. We're going to talk about bones. So if you can look at some of these things, you're getting a preview of why you need to know this in AMP1 is because calcium is important for muscle contraction. Calcium is important for neurotransmitter release. Calcium helps maintain the voltage of a cell, which is how your brain thinks. Or even when we get into chemistry, we're going to talk about something called the hydrogen bond. And one of the reasons we care about hydrogen bonds is because acid will destroy hydrogen bonds. So one of the cool things about these diagrams, too, is it's going to basically encapsulate all everything from AMP1 by the time we get to AMP2. That's another pitch for learn things in AMP1. Don't just try and pass tests in AMP1 because you're going to use certain things all the way through AMP until your final test in AMP2 which is on the urinary system. And I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but the urinary system is the most difficult system in AMP2. So if you learn things well early on, it's going to make that last test in AMP2 a lot easier. And in fact, when we get to AMP2 and we talk about calcium, most of your knowledge of calcium at the end of AMP2 is going to need to be retained when we talk about it in AMP1. And again, calcium is one of those things that's an electrolyte that's controlled by the urinary system. And I don't know if I've mentioned it yet, but the urinary system is the most difficult system in AMP2. All right, that's homeostasis and negative feedback. During exercise, the body cools itself by sweating. Sweating in response to an elevated body temperature is an example of what process? Homeostasis. There is an argument for responsiveness, but homeostasis is probably the better answer. And this is an argument you're going to hear from DJ throughout AMP is when you take the NCLEX, the NCLEX is the nursing board or any boards exam. Sometimes there's two right answers, but there's one that's more right than the other. Um, I'm going to be really honest. You probably cannot conceive of how difficult boards exams are going to be. The dumbest I've ever felt in my life was the day I took the GRE, which is essentially a boards exam to get into graduate school. There are people... Like this question right here is at a level of a 0 0.1 on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being the type of question you're going to have to be able to answer when you take a boards exam. Boards level questions are some of the most incredibly difficult multiple choice that you can even conceive of. You might actually, some of the best advice I might give you is to go buy a prep book for your boards exam now so you can start to see the level of questions you're going to have to answer in order to pass your boards and in order to practice the profession you want to practice in. So here, homeostasis is the better answer. Which of the following is an example of negative feedback mechanism? During labor, uterine contractions begin, levels of the hormone oxytocin continuously rise. As soon as I see continuously rise, I think positive feedback. The thyroid gland releases thyroid hormone under the influence of the hormone TSH. TSH release decreases when thyroid hormone levels reach their set point. I kind of like that one. So when something goes up, things come back down. An individual who is incapable of synthesizing thyroid hormone will often develop an enlarged thyroid gland due to continuous TH, TSH stimulation. So developing something that enlarges sounds like something's growing and growing, no pun intended, and so that's positive feedback. That's questions on negative feedback. Positive feedback kind of preview those and those questions positive feedback is a self amplifying cycle where change leads to an even greater change in the same direction so things build up to a climax some normal examples are childbirth blood clotting protein digestion and generation of nerve signals in childbirth the baby's head presses against the cervix the cervix then releases a signal to the brain to tell the uterus to contract harder so it releases a signal that tells the brain to release oxytocin. So the head of the baby pushes against the cervix. Nerves go from the cervix to the brain, tell the brain to stimulate the release of more oxytocin. Oxytocin goes down to the uterus and tells the uterus to contract harder. And when the uterus contracts harder, 
it's going to have the baby push into the cervix more. When the baby's head pushes into the cervix more, we get more of a release of nerve impulse. So essentially, the baby's head presses against the cervix. The cervix then signals to the brain to tell the uterus to contract harder. When the uterus contracts harder, the baby's head presses harder against the cervix. So the cervix signals the brain to tell the uterus to contract even harder. This causes a buildup in contraction strength until the child is birthed. So positive feedback causes things to build and build and build. In the case of childbirth, that's great. Positive feedback can also be a bad thing where one thing causes problems that then grow into bigger problems. And we talked about that before. So recall that we saw this before where tissue is less able to get oxygen, weakens the muscle that causes breathing. Then with less strength, it's more difficult to draw air into the lungs, causing an even bigger problem or bigger decrease in oxygen loading. So it starts with not having enough oxygen. Not having enough oxygen impairs the ability to get more oxygen. So it gets worse and worse and worse. All right, so this one's kind of a little bit more advanced, but if you want to challenge yourself, just think through this because this is the kind of thinking you have to be able to do if you're going into allied health. So burns can damage cells. Cells are full of potassium. Potassium alters heart function. So potassium is pretty important in heart function, and if you alter potassium, you're going to alter heart function. If you decrease heart function, that means loss of ability to pump blood, and that means decreased oxygen delivery. One of the other problems with the burn is it causes fluid loss. And when you lose fluid, you jump back down over here too. Not only is the heart not pumping as well, but there's not as much fluid to be pumped. So again, you're going to be causing a problem with oxygen delivery. Probably should have drawn an arrow, but to see if you don't deliver oxygen, we're going to come back over here and destroy cells. So for over here, we got decreased oxygen delivery. Probably should have put in an arrow back over to here that if you have decreased oxygen delivery, you're gonna kill more cells. And when you kill more cells, you're gonna start the cycle again, and you're gonna kill more cells. And so this is gonna get worse and worse and worse. And it's one of those things where it's a cluster mess. You're gonna hear me say this multiple times in AP1, especially in AP2, where burns cause a cluster mess, or things cause a cluster mess. So you damage cells and you reduce fluid. The net result is less blood pressure, less oxygen delivery, kill more cells. All right, so we've gone through anatomy and physiology, structural organization, organ systems, necessary life functions, survival needs, feedback control. Our last thing is directional terminology. So we'll finish up our first lecture with directional terminology. Anatomists need a standard position to refer to so we always know where on the body we're talking about no matter what the position of the body is in. This is called anatomical position. Anatomical position is characterized as body erect, so standing, feet slightly apart, palms facing forward. That one's a tricky one because it's easy to put the palms backward. Thumbs point away from the body. I often refer to it as the why me position. Why do I got to know this? So that's anatomical position. There's some basic areas of anatomical language to cover. So we're going to do directional terms. What's up, what's down, what's left, what's right, what's out, what's in. Then we'll talk about regions. So you have specific little words for areas of the body, like brachial is arm. Talk about planes, whether we're cutting with a knife or an x-ray machine or an imaging machine. We'll talk about cavities and then regions. Directional terms. So we'll start with the same image again. So starting with directional terms, we want to be able to locate an injury or problem by saying where it is in the body, often in relation to other parts of the body, and no matter the position of the body. So normally the main confusion in anatomical position is it's always anatomical position, no matter the position of the body. So the head is always superior, even if your head over heels. Also note that the palms are facing forward because that makes the thumbs lateral. As a heads up, proximal and distal can be a bit tricky for some. All right, so here's a list of the terms, but let's go through them individually. Superior means towards the head. Inferior means towards the feet. Anterior means towards the front, and posterior means towards the back. While these are the main terms, occasionally dorsal is used to describe towards the back, and ventral is used to describe towards the front. Anterior and posterior are the more modern terms, so they're used to describe where things are happening in the body, so this injury is anterior to this. But some structures were named using the older terms, so those terms still pop up. So the dorsal root of the spinal cord is a group of nerves that come out of the back of the spinal cord. 
or the ventral cavity is the cavity on the front of the body. Medial means down the middle. Lateral means off to the edges. Intermediate would be in between, so the lungs are intermediate. So your belly button is medial, your hips are lateral. Your lungs or your eyes are intermediate. Superficial means towards the surface, like the skin. Deep means more inside of the body. So superficial can also be called external, while deep also means internal. Proximal and distal refers to arms and legs, so the limbs. Proximal means closer to the attachment of the arm or leg, so closer to the joint. Distal means farther from the joint that attaches the arm or leg. So the wrist is distal to the elbow. The elbow is proximal to the wrist. You might want to practice these more than the others because these are a little bit more tricky. But you can see where you're dealing with arms and legs, which might be in a different position. Proximal and distal works better than superior and inferior. So, so as an example, the fracture is just proximal to the elbow, or the contusion is proximal to the elbow, would help you to quickly localize the injury to here. The knee is what to the ankle? Uh, it's proximal. It's not superior. It's proximal. The thumb is what to the little finger? It's lateral. I suppose you could also argue that it's proximal. The sternum or breastbone protects the heart and therefore is, I'd say anterior, or could have said superficial if superficial was an option too. But I'd say anterior is the best answer there. While performing a dissection, the student noticed that the veins were closer to the skin than the arteries, therefore the veins were superficial. And that is true. Those are directional terms. Regions can also help you localize the injury. So you want to know axial versus appendicular. So axial is head, neck, and trunk. Appendicular are appendages or the limbs. And you want to know that because this is how we divide things up for the bones exams for studying the bones. I guess there's just one bones exam, but we give them out first as axial bones and then appendicular bones. So appendicular means the appendages are arms and legs. And while I don't test you on these smaller regions, like what the pollux is, eventually knowing those regions will help you memorize things like bones and muscles for later lab tests. By the end of the semester, you'll probably know most of them anyway, so you might want to get a jump on them. More regions on the posterior, like the olecranon process, is a part of the humerus that's the elbow. And so knowing the olecranon will help you know that your elbow on the humerus is the olecranon process. Planes are cuts through the body. Whether the cut might be from a camera as an x-ray, CT scan, or MRI, the cut can also be a surgical cut. So we'll go through these individually, but this is a nice review preview slide. So sagittal, mid-sagittal, frontal, transverse. Here again, like with anterior and ventral, there might be two different words for the same exact thing. Sagittal cuts into left and right. Transverse cuts into superior and inferior, while frontal cuts cut into anterior and posterior, so front and back. It also should be noted that frontal is sometimes called coronal, usually with the head or transverse are sometimes called horizontal. When it's a mid-sagittal cut or cut right down the middle, it's called mid-sagittal. If it's not right down the middle, it's just called sagittal. When a cut's not aligned with sagittal, frontal, or transverse, so it's not one of those 90 degree cuts, the cut is termed oblique, which is a diagonal type cut. Can you identify the cut based on the MRI? So the top image in red here is transverse or horizontal. The middle is frontal or coronal, and the bottom picture is mid-sagittal. Which of the following are the two major closed body cavities? Oh, that's too far ahead. We'll skip ahead to that. To amputate an arm, the surgeon would cut in which plane? Oh, that's kind of a tricky one because it depends on where you cut. If you cut it like right through the biceps, that would be a horizontal plane. But if you cut off at the shoulder, that would be a sagittal cut. That'd be one on a test. You'd want to argue it because it depends on where the cut is. A leg amputation would require a cut in which plane? I think there's only one plane here, and that's transverse or horizontal. If someone has broken their leg, they have damaged the appendicular division of the body. Next up is cavities. 
Cavities are confined areas in the body separated by walls made of muscle, tissue, or bone. The dorsal cavity, here in kind of an orange, protects the nervous system. It's divided into two subdivisions, the cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. The ventral cavity houses the internal organs, so like the viscera, the insides, and is divided into two main cavities, thoracic and abdominal pelvic. And there's lots of smaller cavities in there too that we'll go through. So the dorsal body cavity contains the cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. So the brain is in the cranial cavity and the spinal cord is in the vertebral cavity. The ventral cavity houses the internal organs. The ventral cavity is subdivided into several more cavities. So first above the diaphragm shown right here is the thoracic cavity, which houses the mediastinum and the pleural cavity. So the mediastinum is here in orange, pleural cavities are in purple, and then the cardiac or pericardial cavity too should also be included. We'll get to that. Below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity, which has the abdominal cavity as well as the pelvic cavity. You can see that we're gonna break these out here. Pleural cavities, of which there are two, each houses a lung, those are in purple. Mediastinum contains the pericardial cavity, so this area in aqua, and the other organs that pass through the space like the trachea and the esophagus. The pericardial cavity encloses the heart. So the mediastinum contains the esophagus, trachea, thymus, and pericardial cavity. The two pleural cavities house the lungs. We won't get to this till AMP2, but just as an example of the importance of these cavities, if there's a hole in the pleural cavity, the lungs will collapse. Abdominal pelvic cavity is separated from the superior thoracic cavity by the dome-shaped diaphragm. It's composed of two subdivisions. The abdominal cavity contains the stomach, intestines, spleen, liver, and other organs. And then the pelvic cavity lies within the pelvis and contains the bladder, reproductive organs, and rectum. So abdominal cavity is shown here. Pelvic cavity is shown here. One last review figure to test yourself on. So look at a cavity and identify it without looking at the label. So what's this? Mediastinum, what's this? Pleural, what's this? Vertebral, what's this? Cranial, what are these two together? Dorsal, quiz yourself a little bit. Know your cavities. Again, a skill necessary to be successful in this class and AMP in general is to be able to organize a lot of information so that it's easier to learn. So one of the things you needed to know is what are the different organs? You should also know where those different organs are and what cavities they're in. So here's an example of how you can organize the various body cavities as well as what organs are in those individual cavities. Ventral body cavities are also covered with layers of tissue. So we'll talk about these more later, but parietal means up against the wall. So the parietal serosa covers the body walls. So that's usually the outer covering. Visceral means inside, so the visceral serosa covers the internal organs, so the inner organs, so the visceral pericardium would be an example. Sometimes there's fluid in those cavities, and that's called serous fluid, so there's fluid around your heart, and that's in the pericardial cavity. There's several other small cavities in the body, so the oral and digestive cavities house the mouth, and cavities of the digestive organs. Nasal cavity is located within and posterior to the nose, Orbitals house the eyes. The cavity of the middle ear contains the bones or the ossicles that transmit sound vibrations. And then synovial cavities are the cavities around certain types of joints called synovial joints, like your shoulder and knee. Which structure divides the anterior cavity into two sections? That would be the diaphragm. The last thing are abdominal pelvic regions. Another way to identify a possible problem is to use abdominal pelvic regions. So for example, if someone's had an internal bleeding, it'd be nice to identify the region where the bleeding is coming from. So the radiological technician would tell you which region the bleeding is coming from. So surgeons tend to divide the abdominal pelvic region into nine separate areas shown here. However, in most applications, it's just easier to break things down into quadrants. So I want to expose you to these, but we won't use these nine regions. We're going to use the quadrants, which are considerably easier, of course. So right upper, left upper, right lower, and left lower. So it would be fair to ask you, in what quadrant is the pancreas? So the pancreas is in here. Where is the stomach? 
Where's the liver predominantly? That's in the right upper. Where's the appendix? That would be a fair question. So you kind of need to know where your organs are and what organ system they're in. All right, that's our first lecture in AMP1. Thank you.